Hello and welcome to the Tekken Sports Podcast. Tekken Sports is a show about how technology is revolutionizing all of the major sports as well as health and fitness. You can find it on your podcast service of choice. My name is Alex Radu and I'm here with the extraordinary Mandy Kovacs. Hello. This week we spoke with Chris Chapman, the director of sports science at Push, a Toronto-based startup that's been working with groups like the Canadian Olympic team, plus all the biggest news from the last week, new apps or wearables, and your weekly concussion update. But before we get to that, we would really appreciate it if you would review and rate the Tekken Sports Podcast on iTunes and Google Play or wherever else you get your podcasts from. It really does help us grow the show, and we really, really appreciate all the support so far. And with that, sit back and relax, because the Tekken Sports crew is entering the game. All right, Mandy, the news. All right, so first up, the NFL's competition committee has voted to release the full tracking data collected by Zebra Technologies for the 2016 and 2017 seasons to all 32 teams in the league. So these tracking wearables have been required for every player since 2014, but it's always been kept confidential on each team. In fact, it's actually a running joke that a lot of teams don't even look at the data, um, but I'm assuming that will change thanks to this announcement. The NFL has said that every team's data will be shared with all the other teams beginning this April, uh, and then during the upcoming 2018 season, teams will receive league-wide data on a weekly basis. So this is... I mean, I think, you know, like the easy thing to look at here is the fact that now it's teams sharing their data or the NFL sharing everyone's data with with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think that's the easy thing to look at. But the thing that fascinates me the most is that it's a running joke that a lot of teams don't even look at this data. (laughs) I I don't know how true that is or if that's like if that's just, you know, this joke to hide the fact (laughs) that maybe just a couple teams don't or maybe some teams take it more seriously than others. Well, the quote that I read was from some executive in the NFL and they said that up to 30 out of 32 teams don't even bother looking at this data. Which is crazy compared, or considering all that we've talked about data and how many teams in other leagues use it. I think it might also be a staff thing. Maybe you know, like uh, we, we uh, like if some sports teams only have like one or two data people, mm-hmm. and that could be for their business side and their sports side or something like that. So, yeah, I don't know. It could just be a stats thing. That's the thing that interests me the most. But we'll see how uh, if there's any like you know scandal and stuff that comes out with all this throughout the next football season. Yeah, it'll be interesting to keep tabs on that. All right, next, the Dallas Mavericks have announced that they will be accepting cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum for ticket and merchandise payments next season. The team's owner, Mark Cuban, has been investing in cryptocurrencies for years, but has also cautioned others about making the jump unless they can afford to lose the money, according to a recent interview. So the Mavs will be one of the first NBA teams to do this after the Sacramento Kings began taking Bitcoin back in 2014. Uh, I mean, this is the least surprising news of... uh... (laughs) Of the year, I think, so far, that Mark Cuban, of all owners, would get involved with, you know, cryptocurrency. Yeah. That's not news. That's no. That's expected. Well, he's on Shark Tank, isn't he? Yeah. He's, like, a super advocate for all this stuff. Yeah, so we'll <laughs> see. I mean, the Mavericks also have a bajillion and one other problems that they got to deal with before they yep. can figure out cryptocurrencies, so. That's true. All right, and speaking of the Sacramento Kings, they've officially unveiled their bid to win an upcoming NBA All-Star game, and honestly, it's pretty crazy. So they're hoping to get the game in either 2022 or 2023, and they're proposing things like autonomous vehicles shuttling tourists around from the Golden One Center to the Sacramento airport, uh, as well as virtual reality tours of event spaces, and even a partnership with Airbnb to set up more than a 1,000 apartments and homes available for people attending the All-Star game. The city apparently has a hotel room shortage, which is why uh, they haven't had an all-star game before this. Uh, So they also want to dock three luxury cruise ships in the city's port for more housing. They also want to set up a temporary entertainment district that would include an outdoor concert venue and local pop-up restaurants, all in the hopes of winning this all-star game. So what I what I really like about this, and uh, whenever I think about Sacramento, I think about the uh, recent uh, Oscar-nominated movie Lady Bird, which <laughs> takes place in Sacramento, and there's a joke love. in it. I love that movie. Everyone should go watch it. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and in the movie, they joke about how Sacramento is the Midwest of California, <laughs> and that's what those are some of the truest words that I've ever heard in my life. Um, you are so a California boy. I am know. a Cal- I am a California boy, <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh. It's it, so it's really interesting to see what Sacramento's doing here. Um, it's interesting that they're willing to spend money on all sorts of things here when they're not willing to spend on players. But um, <laughs> it's 
it's cool to see this is what we're going to start seeing from bids and all that because yeah. the all-star game does make quite a bit of money it does bring for instance we remember a few years ago when it was in toronto and that did that was huge for toronto mm-hmm. or just canadian basketball too and it was funny because that weekend was also the coldest weekend of the winter if i remember correctly <laughs> so well. many players were upset about that it was yeah, awesome <laughs> but i think it also showed them how the city's still super lively even when it's when it's cold mm-hmm. so it was it was honestly kind of perfect as well yeah um so it's really cool to see what the sacramento kings here are doing i like their big with Airbnb, their partnership there, that's really cool. Um, and this is something that we're going to see smaller cities start doing more. And you know what? This is just going to be good for the city in the future because it doesn't have to be a temporary entertainment district. Yeah. Uh, maybe this does prove, if this works out, that they need new hotel rooms, that this becomes more of a tourist destination. This is really good for the city uh, of Sacramento. So we'll still have to see if it works. I'm sure it will. Yeah, let's hope so anyways. All right, next... Miso Robotics has teamed up with sports and entertainment hospitality company Levi to bring its robotic kitchen assistance to sports venues. So Miso says their robot assistants help real-life staff prepare food faster and believe this will help concession stands deliver fans' food more efficiently during events while decreasing wait times, enhancing consistency, and controlling waste while also improving working conditions for concession staff. So the duo are, ho- the duo are hoping to implement this first autonomous robotic kitchen assistant thing uh, in a Levi operated venue later this year. And so while Levi isn't exactly a well-known name to most consumers, the company actually operates hundreds of sports teams venues in North America, including T-Mobile Arena, where the new Vegas Golden Knights play, the Bell Center, where the Habs play, the Staples Center in LA, where the Kings, Clippers, and Lakers all play, Wrigley Field in Chicago, Dodger Stadium, and I mean, honestly, I could keep going, but I think you get the point. They're a huge company, so this could be cool. We could be seeing robots in concession stands. All right. And now moving on, uh, Twitter Canada has announced that it's signing a live streaming partnership for the PyeongChang 2018 Paralympic Winter Games, which start this Friday, or which started on Friday, March 9th, uh, and go until March 18th. That's a Sunday. So this deal, which is only in Canada, means that Twitter will be live streaming more than 125 hours of content through the Canadian Paralympics team Twitter account. Uh, And all the events, which include hockey, curling, skiing, snowboarding, and biathlon, will also be airing as a regular broadcast on CBC and Sportsnet as well. I think this is actually a really good plan Mm -hmm. by Twitter Canada. Um, We saw how Twitter didn't exactly work as a host for uh, Thursday Night Football and some of of these events. But I think for events like uh, the Paralympics... Um, which maybe aren't, uh, you know, the highest rated TV things. If it just showed up on my Twitter feed uh, by following it, I'm much more likely to watch it. Yeah, it's Uh, a lot more convenient, right? Exactly, yeah. So, like, even if it's just bite-sized clips or just, like, you know, they're just showing the Canadian athletes or, like, a big moment and it's just, like, promoted on my Twitter feed Mm -hmm. um, and on Canadians' Twitter feeds in general, I think that's actually a really cool way to get more people involved with the Paralympic Games. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it definitely needs more coverage, so here we go. (laughs) And so next, apparently, the Tottenham Hotspur of the English Premier League are using Mitel to create one of the most technologically advanced stadiums in the world. So Mitel provides communication infrastructure, so the Hotspur will be using its contact center platform to improve fan customer service, and Mitel's unified comms platform to help employees of the soon-to-be-completed state-of-the-art stadium communicate seamlessly through their mobile devices. So it's worth noting that Mitel is the official business and technology and communication communications partner of the MLB as well, so they clearly have uh, quite a bit of experience in this area. Now, I had missed this part, but is Mitel, is this a brand new stadium being built from the ground up? Yes, I'm not okay. 100% sure of when it's supposed to be finished, but it, it is mm-hmm. a brand new stadium. Yeah, Yeah. so what's, what's really telling about this story is that we're now going to start seeing the brand new stadiums like we're seeing here for the Hotspurs, and then also... Uh, what we're seeing in Seattle for the new NHL yeah. NBA stadium that's being built there. We're seeing two different types of stadiums being kind of made. It's the brand new ones that are being built now in the 21st century with all of this in mind. Mm-hmm. And then also older stadiums that have to be updated. But the yeah. way they're built as well, like with the, the concrete that was used and all that, is not always great for Wi-Fi and for sensors and for all that sorts of stuff. And those mm-hmm. have been been huge business challenges to get over. So it's going to be it's re- going to be really cool to see, like, at some point, all these awesome stadiums that we love might just need to be torn down and rebuilt. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it might, like, if these new stadiums are so far ahead of them, then 
that just might be the reality. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the controversy in Calgary, too, with the Saddle Dome. I think it's the oldest uh, NHL arena now, and the league wants them to tear it down, and they just don't want to do it. And I mean, like, I love it. Like, I went to the Saddle Dome, and it's such, it's such a cool place. It's so unique, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's very dated. It's like 30, 40 years old. Yeah, so, I mean, that's going to be the big question yeah. for stadiums coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and switching to health and fitness for a sec, a new study by medical journal PLOS Biology has found that fitness trackers can help predict when a person is at risk for cardiovascular diseases and metabolic disorders like diabetes. So researchers outfitted 233 random normal people with low-cost wearables and discovered that the devices are much more than just fitness trackers. The data, like resting heart rate, can actually be used in biomedical research, and step counts can indicate patterns and levels of physical activity. So, for example, the sum of the data can be used to determine how the size of the heart is influenced by physical activity and also help identify active individuals that are more likely than others to have enlarged hearts and potentially be misdiagnosed with heart disease. And in the field of lipodomics, which apparently studies pathways and networks of cellular systems in the body, uh, this wearable data can help identify compounds that are affected by how active a person is. And many of these compounds are associated with obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Yeah, so I love this because mm -hmm. so as someone who comes from a family with a lot of, you know, heart disease problems or, you know, it's, uh, and like that go even to my younger sister mm -hmm. somehow, I've, I've, I've skipped some of it, but... Uh, this is going to be really cool to be able to monitor just yourself. And I, it'll be interesting by the time we're in our 30s. Uh, we're in our mid-20s now. Um, so that we still have quite a way to go. Um, just to see how we're going to be able to track our health. And we're not going to necessarily run into the same problems that our parents did with, yeah. uh, you know, heart attacks and stuff like that because of wearables and being able to be a little more on the ball when it comes to that, a little more aware. So that's really going to change, I think, how millennials and Gen Z after us uh, are going to, you know, really work with uh, heart disease and all these other bigger issues and track mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and with it becoming more of a medical device as opposed to a fitness tractor, it's like what you kind of predicted, that these wearables are going to have like a really breakthrough year, either this mm -hmm. year or next year. Yeah. because of their expanded usage. Yeah, like the better they get at tracking heart mm -hmm. rate, the better they get at tracking uh, any medical thing that you might need to track. Yeah. It's, it, they're only going to become more valuable because at that point, it's not just if you're working out, you could wear it even if you're not the person who's working out. You're still tracking your heart. If you have high blood pressure, this could be a really good way to track that. Mm -hmm. Super easy, super cheap. They're only going to get cheaper. Absolutely. All right. And last but not least, a quick hit here. Real Madrid has launched a 360 degree virtual reality channel for mobile devices and traditional TV. So the team has teamed up with The Dream VR, which is a 360 degree content distribution company with the largest VR network in the world. So this channel will offer fans firsthand insight into the team and put out new content every month. All right, that's it for our news today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. We're going to move on now to our new apps and wearables. All right, so uh, for the wearables and the apps this week, I mean, it's it's been a pretty low, uh, slow week, uh, <laughs> to say the least. There really isn't too much news. Um, and the big news was kind of already reported about a month ago as well. So it's not <laughs> the craziest week, but let's get started. So uh, let's start with the fact that Apple has dethroned Fitbit as the wearables champion due to a strong push from the Apple Watch. So this comes via IDC's Top 5 Wearable Device Companies 2017 chart, which tracked worldwide unit shipments. So this isn't the first time this year that we've heard that Apple has leapt into the top spot either, with IDC confirming stats we had heard throughout the last month. So Apple takes the top spot with 17.7 .7 million shipments, up from 11.3 million in 2016. Uh, and that swaps spots with Fitbit, who then fell down to third place with 15.4 million shipments in 2017, which is then down from 22.5 million in 2016. So that's quite a big drop. Wow. Uh, the Chinese-based Xiaomi uh, uh, maintains its second spot with the exact same 15.7 million shipments that it had in 2016. Uh, and then running out the top five is uh, Garmin. Jarmin. I can't pronounce that company's name, so I apologize. Uh, with 6.3 million shipments, and then Fossil with 4.9 million, respectively. The overall wearables market jumped up to 115.4 million shipments from 104.6. So an interesting takeaway is that the top five account for a little more than 50% of all worldwide shipments. 
Uh, it'll be interesting to see how some of these companies outside of the big three grow. With Fossil, for example, seeing its stock price grow 69.2% over the past two months. So clearly the top three brands aren't as safe as we might have thought, uh, considering Fitbit's huge drop as well. Because uh, that wasn't even a tiny drop. That was a significant mm-hmm. uh, 7 million-ish uh, um, shipments drop. So um, we'll have to see where this goes in 2018. And uh, we keep talking about medical devices and all that uh, and how that's going to work. So, yeah. I mean, that's just shocking to me because, A, I didn't know that this Chinese company, Xiaomi, is that how you said yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've never even heard of it. How is that in second spot? How does that surpass Fitbit? That's good. China has a huge install base. I mean, that's fair. I guess, yeah, us in North America, we don't hear about those things. And yeah, I didn't know Fossil was in the top five to begin with at all. Like, these are all just kind of new stats to me in general. So it, it is kind of shocking that Fitbit would drop so much compared to the rest of them. I think with Fitbit, you're starting to see just uh, people kind of get bored with the look. Mm-hmm. And also, they're only now getting into smartwatches. That's true. They were so, solely a, a fitness tracker yeah. before. So they're they're also just starting to get better, too. And honestly, it doesn't help that the Apple Watch uh, Series 3 basically does what Fitbit does, except slightly better. Yeah. So And pretty much the same price point, too, no? I think so, too, yeah. Depending Maybe on, like I mean, 50 bucks it's, more. I mean, granted, it depends. It is more of a watch, that one, so it is more expensive, but it's comparable better. in smartwatch yeah. prices. But yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a slow news week, as I've mentioned already. So <laughs> I just wanted to shout out as our last thing, an interesting wearable I found. So apparently Acer is moving beyond fitness bands and smartwatches with its new leap beads that are aimed at Buddhists and designed to count the number of mantras repeated during prayer. According to Acer, since the beads will count the number of mantras, users can then focus more on concentrating on what is being said rather than counting. So this is one of the first spiritual wearables I've come across, and it'll be interesting to see if it makes a splash. The Elite Beads will be sold in Taiwan later this month, where there were there are reportedly about 8 million Buddhists, and but there are around 500 million globally as well. So plus the Elite Beads, which look basically like prayer be- like a prayer bead band you'd wear around your wrist, also have a step counter, calorie tracker. Uh, sleep monitoring, uh, etc. And then Acer says it wants to introduce wireless payments as well to buy goods or make donations. Uh, it's all. It's also the wireless charger it comes with can also double as a Bluetooth speaker. So this is a very interesting device uh, and like area to get into because we don't really think about spiritual beads or something like that. But that's kind of what this is. This is a spiritual wearable. And while I'm not a very spiritual person myself. Uh, to say the least, it is very interesting to see if this makes a splash. A $500 million million person market is quite big, so we'll see. But isn't the point of Buddhism to, like, forego all material possessions and to focus on, like, your spirituality and yourself? Like, isn't that why so many Buddhist monks move to northern places and kind of hole up in their little sanctuaries? Which sounds so disrespectful. I'm sorry, everyone, but I just, I don't get it. How are these people going to buy them? I don't know enough about... I mean, like, it. obviously not of the 500 million Buddhists in the world. They're not all, you know? No, I guess they're not, like, extreme Buddhist monks. Yeah, so... Uh, I, I We'll see. I mean, it, this is, I think, a first-of-its-kind type thing. Yeah. So, um, well, I'll definitely keep an eye out on this just because I think it's an interesting story. Um, and we'll see. I mean, for all the, we know, Acer's wrong. Uh, there are reports saying <laughs> that Asus also uh, wants to do something about this. Huh. So, yeah, we're, we're just going to have to keep our eyes out. I mean, kudos to them for even attempting to get into this market, though. 500 million people is not something to scoff at. So even if it's, like, marginally successful, mm-hmm. uh, that good for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so that's it for uh, new apps and wearables. So we are now going to jump into your weekly concussion update. So every day, a large portion of athletes with a history of repetitive head trauma are battling with a progressive neurodegenerative brain disease called CTE. Symptoms of CTE include blurred vision, dementia, depression, headaches, memory loss, and mood swings. There is no cure, and it only gets worse with time. This is the number one issue in sports, so every week we'll be updating you on what is happening in the world of concussion prevention. So we have some great news out of Ontario this week. Ontario legislation has passed a new bill named Rowan's Law in memory of 17-year-old Rowan Stringer, who died from concussion-related rugby injuries, that is designed to protect amateur athletes and educate coaches about the dangers of head injuries. Uh, Supposedly, this is the first law of its kind here in Canada, uh, whether on a provincial level or a federal level. 
So, firstly, this new law establishes removal from sport and then return to sport protocols for athletes to ensure that they are removed from a game if a coach or teacher suspects them of having a concussion. Those coaches slash teachers will also then be required to review online resources uh, that will help them identify and manage concussions in their athletes. Additionally, the bill inc- uh, will introduce a concussion code of conduct that will set rules of behavior that will then hopefully also minimize concussions while playing sports. Uh, so before we talk about this new law and its impact, let me provide a little more backstory for those who aren't around Toronto and the Ontario area. Uh, the legislation was introduced after a coroner's inquest into Rowan's death in 2013. Rowan had died from second impact syndrome after multiple concussions, and as a result of the coroner's inquest, her family had learned that she had actually Googled concussion before she passed. So this new law is awesome, frankly. Uh, it was passed with full party support, which we can all agree is a pretty rare thing in 2018. Uh, it's awesome to see Ontario take a lead here, and hopefully we can see other provinces follow suit as well as the federal government. Because, as we know, despite the fact that major sports have a role to play with concussions as well, it really does come to also changing that mentality and preventing head injuries when people are kids mm-hmm. uh, as well. And that's gonna that really honestly starts from a government level. Yeah. So well, no, when I read this, like I'm just I'm so happy they passed this because I believe Rowan uh, was from the Ottawa area, and I went to school in Ottawa. Um, and so it was a really big deal there. Like it happened in 2013. I went, I was in Ottawa at the time and it was just a huge news story. And then as things developed and it became like an actual bill in, um, Ontario legislature, um, so many people were hopeful that this could really change things and prevent this from happening again. And, and I do believe it has that power. So I'm just, I'm so happy it got full party support. Like finally people are coming together for the right reason. I think this will make a huge difference in schools, uh, and in amateur athlete leagues. I agree. Um, it's really only going to, to, to help. I mean, like this can't hurt. Exactly. You know, it's better than doing nothing. Even if it's only minuscule, then at least it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but so obviously we can't predict its actual impact. This is still brand new. It might take a couple more years to implement. Um, but we're going to see, I really like the precedent that it sets. If yeah. it works, then it's super easy for people in Ontario to be like, Hey, parents and coaches and kids of, uh, Alberta, BC, Quebec, uh, don't you want this? This is helping mm-hmm. our kids. Don't you want that? Yeah. <laughs> so you, it should then go there. And then potentially also the federal government might do something. And that would be awesome because I don't think as of yet a actual government, like huge government body has made laws around amateur sports <laughs> and, uh, con- and concussions. So mm-hmm. that would be huge if Canada takes the lead there and Canada has a huge opportunity to really lead the world when it comes to concussions. Yeah, I would love to see this rub off on, yeah, not only other provinces, but other countries like the U.S. Because, I mean, concussions are a huge problem, especially for young people whose brains are still developing. Mm-hmm. We definitely need these protections. Yeah, so it'll be cool to see the U.S., France, mm-hmm. Germany, Britain, you know, every country in the world. <laughs> we can name <laughs> them sports. all. But... <laughs> uh, as, as we saw, unfortunately, uh, last week with the Jalen Brown injury uh, or fall, it doesn't matter what sport you're playing. You can have crazy head injuries mm-hmm. and people need to be protected. So this is hopefully this is a really good first step. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. All right. So that's it for the concussion update. So next up for our discussion this week, we had, uh, or Mandy, actually, not not we, uh, <laughs> Mandy interviewed Chris Chapman, the director of sports science at Push. It's a Toronto-based sports technology startup that works with groups like the Canadian Olympic team and the San Francisco 49ers. So uh, Mandy, take that away. Well, perfect. Again, thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, hopefully I won't take up too much of your time. I really just wanted to know a little bit more about Push and I mean, how the company started, what your goal is. Yeah, so um, Push was started by our CEO, Rami Al-Hamad, and um, he kind of built it in his basement. He's a mechatronics engineer from Waterloo um, and was just trying to solve a problem, essentially, on quantifying uh, metrics in the gym because he liked working out. Um, so our, we started off with our first product, the Push Band, which was one of the first accelerometers on the market, uh, wearables on the market uh, for gym-based performance. Then it's, you know, there's Fitbits and stuff like that out there, but that's more for your everyday exerciser, whereas the push band is more for high performance. Like we work mostly with pro sport and NCAA. Um, you know, we're in pretty much every pro league around the world at this point. And it's starting to make its way down to consumer level. Um, you know, one thing we've done is we've made it affordable prior to push um, to get similar technology costs over two grand. 
And so now it's a couple hundred dollars. So we've removed cost as one of the biggest barriers to access. And then from there, we got contracted to do work with the 49ers. And it's kind of a long story how it came about. But essentially, we became a custom tech solution for them. And we built out a whole athlete readiness system, which is another product of our company called The Vital. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like a daily readiness um Subjective questionnaire, measuring heart rate variability, when both those are, are uh, measures of daily readiness. You know, we build hardware solutions that are in their locker room and cafeteria, so the athletes have to walk by in order to do their daily assessment. And then the information goes straight to the coaches um, so they can make decisions based on training. And now that system is used in um, many of the other pro leagues, major league baseball teams, NBA teams. And then our last product is a software side that relates to the first product, the band, which now you can, um, you can write programs and send them to the app that correlates with the band. And then all the data that you collect in the gym shoots back to the the software so that you can do reporting and look at time histories of your data and that kind of stuff. So. We've kind of really grown into a multifaceted sports technology solutions company. Can you explain the arm band a little bit more? Because you said that it uh, tracks the velocity of an athlete's movement. So how exactly does it do that? Yeah, so originally the athlete would wear it on their arm. And as an accelerometer, it measures changes in movement, uh, changes in speed. And through using physics, biomechanics, through math, we can estimate Different things like velocity, how fast they're moving, how much power they're producing, how much force they're producing. So there's a lot of metrics that are very important because in the gym, previously, only how much you were lifting was the metric that was used. But now, and we had to use our eyes to measure how fast we're moving, which the eyes are not a good sensor. So now we can actually measure this stuff because sport happens fast. So the ability to train fast and to measure it is extremely important for athletes. Speed measure to see if they're getting better, to see if they're moving in the desired speed ranges that we want. So yeah, most of it is done. It's driven by algorithms under the hood. Okay. Um, we have a, a lead algorithms engineer who's also from Waterloo. You know, we're very fortunate to be close to Waterloo, and that's our engineering team are all graduates from there. And as you can see, the Toronto with Google City and um, all these things coming, it's, it's Waterloo engineering that's driving a lot of that. So we just lucked out that we have some of the best in the world at what they do. Yeah, it really Uh, seems like Toronto's been a good home for the company. Yeah, I mean, and it's all coming down to the Waterloo grads. Yeah, just super fortunate. Like, we've spent time, because we work with the Niners, we spent time in Silicon Valley, and so we're at Stanford. And then in Boston at MIT is where some other competitors come from. And it seems like Waterloo's like a combination of both of those schools, to be honest. We did some work with Intel on a prototype project we're working on that isn't public yet. And when we were down at Intel, they even said their best engineers are from Waterloo. So it kind of opened my eyes anyways as a sports scientist, biomechanist, that we're just fortunate to be in the the mecca of engineering. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about working with the 49ers? Uh, And I know that you also worked with some of the athletes on Team Canada for the, the Olympics that just finished. So what were those experiences like? Yeah, so the Niners was interesting. Um, Chip Kelly at the time, who's no longer the coach there, wanted a daily readiness solution. And there was nothing on the market that really fit their needs. And uh, so they contracted us to build out the exact system that they wanted. It's interesting because the components of the system are things that commercially exist. It's how we put them together and how we amalgamated the data so that, A, collecting the data was frictionless. You have pro athletes. They don't want to spend time. They don't want to wear stuff, so it has to be super simple. So collection takes four minutes at most. And then on the back end, the data gets automatically compiled and put into reports and automatically sent to the coaches. So they don't have to do any work in between. It's all automated. Mm -hmm. But basically, we're saving everyone time. We're saving the athlete's time on collection and saving the coach's time on the back end. And so it was a lot of back and forth, making sure that the hardware was what they wanted and then the software custom solutions. And then they also wanted us to pull in their on-field GPS data, which is kind of their daily workload. So we pulled that into the system as well to give them a full daily snapshot of 
how the athlete's doing, both on the field and off the field. So since then, we've been embedded with the 49ers. You know, we've done some other work for them. And even though they've had a, a coaching change, all the staff, you know, we're still doing other custom work with them at this time. That sounds fascinating. And now, so our podcast obviously focuses on how technology is really changing the sports world. Um, and, I mean, with you being in the center of that, I feel like you have a really good or unique perspective on how it might be changing. So what has your experience shown you about how sports have really evolved over the years because of new technology? Yeah, well, it's interesting right now. Um, technology moves so fast, and there's a massive inundation of tech. So um, coaches and athletes are being thrown all kinds of new tech left, right, and center, and there's almost an overload of it right now. Um, there's so much data accessible. The issue is is not the collecting or the ability. It's how do you handle all this data and make sense of it and then turn it around and make it usable to have impact. So I think that's where some of the issues are and kind of how I got involved. You know, I'm a strength conditioning coach by trade. I worked in the uh, the Olympic world at the Canadian Sport Institute training athletes for a lot of years. And so me being here, I'm an end user and I bring context to everything, which a lot of tech companies are missing. Mm -hmm. So I can say like, no, that's not going to work. That's not what a coach wants or that's this is what we need to do because this is what's going to make the coach's job easier. The biggest thing about tech, it has to be easy and frictionless for the athlete, so like it almost doesn't exist. And for the coach, it has to to make their job easier. Mm -hmm. Save time, do the work for the coach, whereas a lot of technology makes more work for the coach. So that's kind of where we're at, and what you're seeing is an explosion of tech, and then you're going to start to see it prune into the few pieces that really matter and even in our space, we're starting to see that. Um, you're starting to see some of our competitors uh, die off, to say the least, <laughs> just because they don't have the user interface that's easy to use or there's a piece missing in their underlying hardware. There's just something contextual that doesn't really fit with the daily workflow of coaches and athletes. That's a really good point. Do you think that we'll ever reach a point where there's maybe too much tech in sports or, you know, too many different ways that we can track athletes or too much data to really ever go through? I I honestly think we're there right now. That's mm. what you're seeing. Um, and, and data overload, data saturation is a thing. And you're starting to see a bit of a pushback with a lot of coaches who want to completely avoid tech. The problem is the the new generation coming up, millennials, young athletes, they embrace tech and they love tech. So you're actually starting to see some younger athletes pushing their coaches to adopt technology. So we're kind of in this phase of figuring out how do we get around this inundation of tech? How do we make it simple and easy and not bombard athletes with, oh, you have to wear this and then use this and then go to this machine and put this on. So I think we're in it right now, and we'll we'll see what comes out in the end. You'll see the the ones that survive will be the ones that understand the issues. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll reach a balance at some point in the future of you know trying to figure out when uh, that or where that line is of too much technology, or will there be just so much pushback that maybe we'll actually see it regress? Um, it'll regress a bit, but it'll find a, a balance point for sure because computers and tech can do things that humans can't. Uh, it can save us a lot of time and a lot of work and give us answers that without it, there's no way we would have. So it's not going to disappear completely. That'll never happen uh, in a million years. But it will, yeah, it will find that balance point that you're talking about where maybe it's one or two key things um, that make a difference as opposed to trying to do everything at once. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Again, I appreciate it. No, yeah, not a problem. Pleasure chatting. All right, that was my interview with Chris Chapman, Director of Sports Science at PUSH. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoy the rest of the show, please be sure to give us a like and a rating on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever else you listen to us. Um, and if you'd like to follow us for more content, we're on Twitter at ITB Tech and Sports or our personal accounts. I'm at Mandy V. Kovacs and Alex with Alex T. Radu. So thanks for listening. This was episode 34, which is incredible. Bye, everyone.